The term black liberation theology reverberates even today, almost half a century since it was introduced. This week, we're thinking about it once again because the Reverend James Coney just passed. Now, Dr. Coney died this past Saturday at the age of 79. Up until his death, he was still teaching at the Union Theological Seminary here in New York. His books, Black Theology and Black Power, A Black Theology of Liberation, and God of the Oppressed, really transformed the relationship many people had with institutionalized religion. If God is in the world, where people are abused and exploited, what then is God doing? This was my question as I wrestled with the fire that was burning Three, two. inside. I want to introduce someone who's been following his career a lot, quite a bit. Dr. Obery Hendricks of Columbia University, his research focuses on the intersection of religion, politics, and social policy in America today. He's also a member of the Faith Advisory Council of the Democratic National Committee. Now, you've studied Cohn quite a bit. Mm -hmm. If you could just folk first explain to us black liberation theology, because it may be so ingrained that people think they know it, but not mm -hmm. quite. Mm -hmm. Sure. First, I <coughs> Jim was a very close friend of mine and colleague. I first read him in 1980s. 1980s. Seven, yeah. And uh, black liberation theology essentially puts African Americans uh, in the center of the biblical story. Hmm. Um, and the Bible is understood through the prism of, of, of our experiences, uh, you know, our turmoils, uh, our, our uh, victories, our uh, defeats. Um, and it's really based on the Bible itself because what's not really taught is that the Exodus was really a liberation event, a liberation event. It was a class liberation event, actually, because the Hebrews were not, not a religion. And so um, uh, black liberation theology takes that in, into account. It also takes into account that the major focus of Jesus, the thing he talks about more than anything else, was the poor and the, the impoverished and, and the vulnerable. And so um, black theology says that the Bible is speaking to, to us. Uh, it, we're being told by that Bible that, we're, that we are valued mm -hmm. um, and uh, that we will prevail uh, ultimately in, in our quest you know, to, to get full parity full equity in this society. So when we talk about James Cone's major contribution, what was the critical shift in thinking that took place? Because clearly African Americans in the United States had been religious before him. Yeah. But this was something special. What was that critical shift? Did mm -hmm. he just look at it through the lens of the black American experience? Or was it a call to action to all people of faith? Well, I mean, ultimately it's a call uh, to action of all people of faith. But the particularity was very important in 1967, 68, um, because remember that was the black power period and um, I do recall that because I was there that there were many young people who were turning their back on Christianity and the church saying it was a white religion and they wanted nothing to do with it and, uh, and Jim Cohn was uh, he, he said that it really came out of his concern to make uh, to show that the Bible the radicality of the Bible to keep young people in the fold. The radicality of the Bible? Yeah. What does that mean? Well, I mean, there's some very radical, uh, radical statements there. Jesus makes some very radical statements. Uh, uh, Luke pr presents as his first sermon, uh, the spirit of the Lord's upon me because it's anointed me to bring good news to the poor, mm. freedom to the captives, uh, sight to the blind, and liberation to the oppressed. I mean, that's, that's radical. When you talk about good news to the poor, you're talking about structural change. Uh, there's always that quote, you know, religion is the opiate of the masses. He did not consider religion no. to be an opiate of any sort. In fact, it was energizing folks to protest, to demand their rights and place in society. Yeah, yeah. He spoke against this quietistic uh, Christianity that was used largely to keep black people quiet. Mm. Um, to get your reward in heaven rather than yeah, here on earth. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, also to see ourselves in, in the Bible. You have to remember there were white Jesuses everywhere at the time. People thought God was white. 
And he, uh, he changed that, that paradigm. He said God was black, Jesus was black, ideologically, in the sense that they were, they were also in solidarity with our struggle. Not ontologically black, but that they were very much in, uh, in, uh, att attuned to our struggle in the world. And that was a, a really a, a major shift. So what about the black church? A long major, it's really an, an American institution mm -hmm. where so many African Americans were culturally connected. How did mm -hmm. that black church change, if at all, because of the black liberation theology? Well, it has changed, um, not enough, uh, because uh, most African American clergy, I think, are, are not theologically trained, so they would not have come in contact with it. But Jim Cohn spoke so many places. He trained so many excellent students um, who became professors and became pastors, uh, like um, Raphael Warnock at Ebenezer Church in Atlanta is one of his students. And so that has made inroads, but the church still is, is quietistic. It still talks about over yonder uh, much too much. Most churches are not involved in the African-American struggle uh, for freedom and equality. Um, uh, he they, criticized that, right? Cohn really criticized that, this whole notion of, we talk about separation between church and state, but can you really hide behind that statement? Mm -hmm. What was his major critique about that? Of the church? Well, the notion that the churches aren't more politically active, the idea that, that they, they weren't you know, on the ground fighting. Well, he was not, I mean, that was part of his mission, to. Uh, to really, I mean, to change the theology of, of one waiting for uh, to die and go to heaven, to, to um, show that the radicality of the gospel is about struggle to bring liberation and to bring justice. See, justice, um, in Hebrew is mishpat, that is the most used term and the most used concept in the Bible. Uh, you see it throughout, especially the, the Old T Testament. And so, in a sense, it's just really highlighting what is there. We should be struggling for justice for all people. But black theology, in its particularity, says, well, you know, it's focusing on primarily black people. You know, you talk about the, the Bible saying that we must uplift poor people. Well, black people, are more, um, um, they're more bl poor black people in America than any, anywhere else. So As it, a percentage, yeah. Yes. I mean, so we don't, um, it's not exclusionary. It's just, it just focuses on the needs and the struggles and the aspirations of black folks. And you see, that was new in the church. Because that was radical, focusing on justice in the here and now, as opposed to waiting for eternal bliss Absolutely. Yeah. after you're dead. A Absolutely. And uh, that was, was very important. And he got a lot of pushback, you know, initially. Um, and there's still a lot of people in the church, a lot of preachers, we don't accept that. Um, you knew him personally. How, how did he take that pushback? Oh, for, it didn't faze him at all. <laughs> if anything, it, it energized him. He was a very gracious man. Um, you know, you read the fierceness of his words and the, and the courage behind his words, um, and you expect a different kind of person, but you meet him. He was generous. He was gregarious. He laughed very easily. Um, and he just looked forward to what he had to do. And you must recall, he got he got um, honored uh, and famous so early in his career that he really didn't have to look over his shoulder. You know, he was the man. There's a James Cone uh, uh, endowed chair at, I think it's Heidelberg in, in uh, University in Germany. So he didn't have to worry about that. Now, in his long career, he's seen so many evolutions. He right. was around during the birth of the Black Lives Movement. Do you think that he would have seen the black church and other institutions making progress. Would he see change now, or do you think he would believe that they're still stuck in an old pattern? Well, many of them are still stuck in the old patterns. <coughs> Pardon me. And some of them, like claim to be a little more radical, are st still stuck in the old patterns. I mean, how, how, how do we know? Because we have a zillion black churches in America, and very little is getting done. We don't see, um, we don't have many lobbyists coming out of the church. We don't have many um, policy proposals coming out of the church. I mean, if, if, if these churches stood up in our communities, our communities would not be as poor. They would not be as broken. But in their defense, some people will say, if you become an overtly political organization, you might lose your tax-exempt status. There is this church separation between church and state. This mm -hmm. is what they will argue. Do you buy that argument? 
No, because we're talking about the gospel. And so when the gospel says you must struggle for justice, we struggle for justice. Now, I mean, of course, there's a line that one not supposed to cross for tax tax purposes. But when we talk about the politicality, everything is political. And we, it's, it's about, you know, distribution of goods and, and welfare and, uh, uh, you know, all, all the good things of life. Well, that's political. And that's what we're talking about, a more equitable distribution of the good things in life, not just the uh, uh, material things, but peace of mind, you know, security, um, uh, not being beaten down with these uh, external inferiority complexes they try to put on us. You've studied this area quite a bit. You know, politicians seek your advice. You look at the black church. Some of these churches have grown enormously wealthy, pastors with private jets and mansions, yachts, do you believe that they are doing enough for social justice given the power that they yield? Back in the 60s they were not nearly as powerful as they are today. N no, they're not doing, they're not doing enough. I, I have questions about a pastor flying around in a private jet anyway. I mean, it's, I have questions about folks getting rich uh, preaching what Jesus did for, for free. For the poor? <laughs> yeah, for working for the poor. Um, he did it for free, and these folk are, uh, he preached for free, they get rich. Um, if the churches, churches have all these resources, what they often do is just build bigger churches. Um, now there are a number of them that are involved, like uh, Jeremiah Wright's old church in, Sh in Chicago, Trinity United Church of Christ. He had, oh, 68, 70, um, ministries out in the community doing things. I mean, he was extraordinary pastor. But, you know, many of them don't even really have congregations anymore. They're more like audiences, you know. Mm. It's, it's more like entertaining. Martin Luther King said, you know, churches aren't entertainment centers. are monkeys for entertaining and not, and not pastors, not preachers. And that is not really understood too much because the paradigm now, the model is to be an entertainer, a pulpit entertainer. They call that being moved by the Spirit, and, and uh, you know, you have people saying, well, we're Pentecostal, we're Baptist Pentecostal, we're mm. AME Pentecostal, which that means is that there's a more energetic uh, performance. I mean, let's, 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 let's face it. And he had a big problem that, with that, um, and people with large churches like Jeremiah Wright, many of them do, do too, but I'm very disappointed. You say they're not doing enough, but what and how should they be taking steps? Well, for one thing, I could use the resources very differently. Um, I know one church that was built for $61 million like 10, 15 years ago. $61 million yeah, dollar church. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, a lot of that, that money could have, at least half of it, I mean, a $30 million dollar church, that's still a problem for me, but, you know, you take half of that, you can make a big difference in the community. See, many churches are focused on institutional maintenance. Uh, they're inward focused, and they're not focused enough on the outside. And they'll, I mean, many of them do things, but they're small things. They'll have a food pantry once a week, or they'll uh, have a, uh, a clothing sale, you know, uh, uh, a rummage sale and all those kinds of things. So small in comparison to their wealth. Oh, absolutely. And, 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 uh, and their reach. I mean, think about it. If every pastor, every, every black pastor, every white pastor, if they just focused on the major concerns of the Bible, doing justice to the poor and the weak and the homeless, if they just focused on that, that would have immense policy uh, implications. For instance, this Trump um, budget would, would never have been able to get through if the churches were mobilizing and speaking out and saying, no, this does not serve the interests of our, of our people. The same way with, with health care. Um, um, Secretary Price came out today and said that, <clears throat> that the onslaught on Obamacare means that, that health care costs are going to rise for, uh, for poor people. Don't hear any hue and cry in, in the church. You have a thousand, ten thousand members, and you know you take them out to city hall, take them to the congressman's office. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they they do very little of that. Now there are some who do. I know some, and they, they are, uh, but they're few and far between. So we know what they're not doing, but what about why? What would be the reason that they're not doing it if it's so easy, as you say? Well, it's it's. Uh, one reason is uh, has to do with the way you understand the gospel itself. 
And if you understand that, it's all about um, um, building salvation so you can go to heaven. Um, that is not, that's going to keep your focus sort of in with an individual. Um, uh, so that's, that's part of it. Another part of it is that... Interestingly, so it, hearing you say that makes me think that everyone wants a pretty casket and not a suitable house over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they, um, and they don't want to leave a legacy behind of, of, of struggle for liberation for the people. Um, you know, a lot of pastors say, well, I'm saving souls, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I'm saying, yeah, but, but what about the rest of them? I mean, what about the rest of their lives? What about their bodies? I mean, what are we doing for that? Jesus said we're supposed to be concerned about that. Um, many of them just don't know any better. Those are some of the old definitions, and many of them still are stuck in that old white theology that, uh, that's sort of quietistic when it comes to uh, when it comes to the world. So do you think that black liberation theology would be firmly opposed to the modern state of the black church if some of those pastors, if some of those clergy had instruction in black liberation theology, do you think things would be different? Yeah, I think to some extent they would. I, I really think it would make an impact. But part of the problem is that there is a, uh, a very prevalent uh, model for ministry that is all about numbers. It's all quantitative, building up your membership, raising money, and that, that kind of thing. And a lot of it, and we talk about the pulpit performance, pulpit entertainers, that's so ego-driven mm. um, that when, you know, when you focus on yourself, building your own little fiefdom, you just don't, I mean, you, you just don't have the focus to do things out, outside of the, the church. So what are we to make of people who believe and understand black liberation theology, feel that they have a calling within the church? Should they be joining the church or should their efforts be focused somewhere else? How do you negotiate your call for faith but also your intellectual understanding of black liberation theology? Well, you know, um, folks should always uh, get together with folks who have freedom fighting sensibilities should get together with others those sensibilities um, but if they are people of faith they should find people of faith who feel like they do and try to work with them individuals you know it's hard to do things as as an individual um, I also say that not everybody needs to be a preacher and we need folk who are people of faith who are driven to really struggle in the world. Um, mm. I'd, rather, I'd rather see that. There are some folk that I would want to be pastors because they have leadership skills and they are selfless and they're determined to make a difference. Um, others, I'd like to see them not, not get the opportunity to throw a, uh, to throw a wrench in, in the wheel. You know, while, we, while we know that some of these black churches have become enormously successful, on average, according to some data, the black church attendance has been going down, sort of on average across the U.S. For those few churches that are actually embracing black liberation theology, do you think that that is a potential area of growth, that they could grow their memberships? Well, absolutely, absolutely. I, I wrote a book called The Politics of Jesus, <clears throat> which is one of the more influential books in the uh, black biblical studies. And it talks about the radicality of, of, of Jesus. And uh, I've had many people say that, you know, my, my kids were all against the church. They read this and they realized that there's a place for them, uh, a place for them there. So, um, you know, th that must be the center of it all. Um, uh, holding up the radicality of Jesus and I think that that would give the, the young people something to, to hold on to but they don't want to come to the, to the old ways. On the other hand, um, you know, these hip hop of gospel folk and, and mm -hmm. all that, and they say well, we're calling young people to the church. The question is, what are you calling them to? Are you calling them hip hop? You calling them the struggle? And on that note, we have to end. What are you calling them to? We've been speaking with Dr. Barry Hendricks of Columbia University, remembering the legacy of James Cone. <laughs>